Welcome everyone to our kickoff of the summer PDP series. We are super excited to have Marissa Orr with us this evening. Marissa is a former Google and Facebook executive. She's a best-selling author and a leadership speaker. Melissa spent 15 years working at today's top tech giants. She has conducted talks for thousands of people in the US, Europe, and Asia Pacific at companies and universities such as Google, Twitter, Pace University, New School, American Express, and more. And she's here with us tonight. We are so delighted. Originally from Miami, Marissa received her master's degree in decision and information sciences from the University of Florida. Her best-selling book, Lean Out, The Truth About Women, Power, and the Workplace, was released by HarperCollins Leadership in June of 2019. Featured in Forbes, Fox, Yahoo, Finance, and CNBC, Lean Out is not simply a retort to Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In, but a revolutionary path forward with the power to change the lives of men and women in the corporate world and beyond. With Lean Out, Marissa provides a fresh voice for a new generation of thinkers. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Marissa Orr. Thank you very much. I'm super excited to be, quote unquote, here in my living room, um, but talking to you guys today. I am having a spontaneous issue with Zoom, so I'm dialed in through my browser. If there are any issues, Mary, maybe you can uh, say something in the chat, um, flag me down, or just go like this or something. Um, but hopefully you're everyone's fine. Right now you're fine. Okay, great. So today I'm going to tell you guys just a few stories about my time working at Google and Facebook. And these stories really explain the premise of Lean Out and how I came to write it. And the first story is about one of my best friends, Carol, who I met about 10 years ago when we shared an office together at Google. And Carol is awesome. She's fun and kind and smart, like exactly the kind of person that you'd want as your best friend. But we don't see each other much these days, so now we text a lot. And when we text, honestly, it feels a lot less like I'm chatting with that awesome best friend, and it feels more like I am dating this dude who is emotionally unavailable. So to give you an example of what I mean, I'm going to show you guys a typical text thread between me and Carol. And... For some reason, it won't let me. Can you see the full screen? Yes. Okay. So here we go. Haven't seen her in a while. Can't wait to catch up. With some emojis in there. Always need a margarita. Can never have enough emojis. And then I wait. I wait for the validation that she, too, is just as excited to see me. And I wait, and inevitably, five hours later, I get this. Now, clearly this is not an acceptable response because now I'm wondering, like, is she mad at me? Did I do something wrong? So I can't go through the day without knowing. I send an ambiguous expression emoji to communicate. I am uncertain how she's feeling toward me. And I get this, which really is nothing. One more quick example. This is verbatim, a more recent text conversation between us, and it's when I got my book deal. Now, everybody in my life told me I was insane, that I would never get a book deal. And after working my butt off for a very long time, I, when I finally got my book deal, and it was with Harper Collins, no less, this was the most exciting thing that had ever happened to me in my entire life. So naturally, I text Carol about it, and I got this. Like, not even an extra I, like nice, just nice. Now, I know Carol loves me. I know she's excited for me. We just have very different ways of communicating. She is very direct and to the point, never uses exclamation points, not even on text, God forbid an emoji, whereas I am very expressive and I use a lot of emotional language. And this also happens to mirror a male and female dominant way of communicating. Neither way is right or wrong. Like most things in life, each has its good or bad, good and bad. Or not, because according to a women's workshop that Carol and I attended, my style was actually just all bad. 
It was a two-day course, and over the two days, we learned all the ways that women undermine themselves with language. So whereas men speak to establish authority and state opinions as facts, women hesitate and use qualifiers, like I'm not an expert, but we apologize more often. Over the two days, there was never anything anything positive mentioned about a female style. It was as if the entire goal of the workshop was to get us to stop speaking like women and to start speaking more like men and Carol. Now, I understood the intention of this, right? Men do speak and behave in a certain way and they are promoted more often, so perhaps we should model that behavior. But at the same time, I couldn't think of anything less feminist or less empowering than holding out men as the benchmark to which we should aspire. So it was after this workshop, really the first time I decided to write my own perspective on the topic and deliver it as a presentation. So it started out in a small conference room at Google with a few women, mostly were my friends, so I forced to be there. But over time, more women started to show up and it grew from one presentation into a series of lectures that I gave not only at Google, but um, as you heard, other companies and colleges across New York, and I was thrilled. I mean, this was, I was so passionate about helping women and speaking. I kind of had this dream in the back of my mind that if I kept doing this on the side for 10 years or so, maybe I could start doing it full time. But then amidst all of this, I got a, in March of 2015, I got a call from Facebook. And from there, my life took a dramatic turn and things unfolded in ways I could have never expected. Now, before I go into my transition from Google to Facebook, I first have to give you a little bit of context on my background with Sheryl Sandberg, who is, of course, the COO of Facebook and author of Lean In. So Sheryl and I are actually from the same hometown, a small neighborhood in South Florida. We went to all the same schools, elementary, middle, grew up in houses around the corner from each other, both worked at Google and eventually Facebook. Now, I first found this out. Uh, so we had actually never met because we are 10 years apart, so I didn't know her growing up. But I found this out when I was working at Google back in the early days, and she was working there too. And I thought about reaching out to her, introducing myself, whatever. But honestly, uh, she's never had the courage, and I had no idea what I'd even say. But then in February of 2016, after 13 years at Google, I left for a job at Facebook. And my very first week there, I found out that Cheryl would be speaking on stage the following week at our sales conference in San Francisco. So I thought, oh, this is the perfect time to reach out, especially like my women series had been doing pretty well and I you know, felt good about that. I thought maybe I'd mention it. Anyway, so I sent her an email uh, explaining you know, the common mutual connections we have and asked if she would just have a second to meet in person, say hello the next week at the conference. And she, to much to my surprise and delight, she wrote back right away and gave me 20 minutes on her calendar in the green room right before she was going to take the stage at the conference the following week. So the next week, it's now my second week at Facebook. I'm in San Francisco for the conference, and I'm waiting outside the green room for Cheryl's assistant for a meeting. And I, I'll be honest, I was super nervous. And so I'm standing out there outside the green room, like doing all my positive affirmations and my self-talk and start doing Amy Cuddy power poses, and then nothing's working. And suddenly I think, you know, what am I doing? Like, this is meeting, this is like meeting a girl from back home, you know, like one of my old girlfriends. It's like family. I don't need to go in there like I'm meeting some billionaire and one of the most powerful women in the world. This is like, you know, meeting one of my girls from back home. So I'm like, yeah, that's the mindset I'm going to go in with. I'm sure you can maybe see where this is going. But uh, her assistant comes out, leads me back into the green room, and I'm like all in this mindset of going to like, you know, whatever. She introduces us and I go in for it. Like, this. I'm like, hey, and it was immediately clear that like she did not have the same mindset coming into this because in my enthusiasm, I totally missed that she had politely extended her hand because now it's crushed in between us and this horribly awkward bear hug basically felt like I had violated this woman before we even sat down. Um, but we go on to talking and at some point, she mentions the career challenges of single moms, because I'm a single mom of three kids, and I'd mentioned that in my, in my email to her. So when she said that, that's all you have to say to me is you get me going, I start telling her all about all the hard times in my life and what they've taught me about uh, confidence and perseverance and self-respect. And in the middle of all this, uh, she holds up her hand and says, 
actually, do you mind if I get my laptop? This is really powerful stuff, and I just want to make sure I get it down. And from there, Sheryl Sandberg went on to transcribe everything I said for the rest of the meeting. It was like unbelievable. And at the end, she closes her laptop and says, look, I'm writing a book on resilience, which then became her second book, Option B. And I think your story would be perfect to feature. Do you mind if my researcher gets in touch with you for next steps? I'm like, absolutely. Thank you so much. So she closes her laptop, goes on stage. I leave the green room and I'm like, mic drop. It's my second week at Facebook and clearly Cheryl Sandberg and I are going to be best friends at all these crazy fantasies. I'm like, we're going to write books together and go on girls trips that she'll pay for. Um, and not to spoil the ending here, but none of that actually happened uh, because I got back to my new job at Facebook the next week in New York and I had much bigger, I never heard from Cheryl or her researcher again, which was fine because I was contending with much bigger issues at that point. So getting back to that call I mentioned in March of 2015, that was from a senior executive at Facebook who I refer to in the book as Kimberly. And it was a recruiting call. She was looking for a marketing and strategy business partner and wanted me to, to join. And I was pretty happy at Google at that time, but Kimberly is one of these people that is like so over the top charming that knows exactly what to say to make you feel like, you know, she gets me which in my case is mostly, she'd be like, Marissa, you're so amazing. And I'd be like, yes, you understand me. And this is the kind of leader I want to work for. I might have a humblest of moments. But anyway, she won me over. And I joined Facebook. And now it's my third week. So the week after the sales conference. And it's my first in-person meeting with Kimberly. So as soon as we sat down in the conference room, I could tell that her attitude toward me had completely changed. The very first thing she said to me was, do you mind if I give you a little bit of feedback? Mind you, it's my third week there. I said, sure. She says, look, Mara, so we hired you because we know you're good. So you don't have to go around trying to prove it to everyone because you're coming off as frazzled and out of control. And the punches to the gut kept coming, you know, I asked too many questions. I'm never happy. And I spoke up just once during all of this. And it was to ask, like, is there any, are there any examples you can share? Because I mean, I was horrified. I certainly not intending to appear this way. She kind of dismisses me with a brush of her hand and says, look, Marissa, you're just not the same person you were in the interview process. And I was like, bitch, I was thinking the same thing about you. Now, I didn't actually say that, but it would have been so amazing if I did. Anyway, after that, everything was a blur. Um, Kimberly wouldn't return my emails. She wouldn't meet with me. She wouldn't acknowledge me in public. Um, it was just a really horrible experience in a very dark time. But it was one of those dark times where you, only in those times you ask yourself those questions like, who am I and what do I want? And when I did ask myself those questions and I was honest with myself about it, the answer was, I did not want to be in the corporate, I wanted to pursue my dream of writing a book and speaking on these issues of women full time. So in the end, regardless of how bad that whole experience of Facebook was, it was a gift because it's really when I started taking my book seriously and working on it. And I don't know if I would be here today speaking to you guys if that hadn't happened. Uh, oh, and by the way, I found out eventually why Kimberly had turned on me. And sometimes I ask people why they might think, but we'll improvise here. Um, the reason was my meeting with Cheryl. So she saw it as a sort of political maneuver, you know, trying to get in with her, which if you know me, I mean, I literally was hoping to just have a rich and powerful best friend. But regardless, she saw it as a political maneuver and um, totally misread that situation. But anyway, again, I thank her. It was a gift. Now, that's really the story of how I came to write the book. It's not what the book is about. The book is an attempt to answer just one question, which is, what have we gotten wrong about women at work? Because at this point, we have to admit we are getting something wrong. For the past 30 years, we have invested billions of dollars, not to mention an enormous amount of time, energy, and resources into solving the gender and wage gap. And in those 30 years, the numbers have barely budged. In some cases, they're going backwards. And I usually ask audiences, you know, imagine that they were working, they had a project at work that they had a billion dollar budget in 30 years. And after 30 years and a billion dollars, they had made zero progress. Like it wouldn't happen. And yet 
with this social issue, we keep throwing the same solutions against the wall, hoping something eventually will change. So lean out is really an attempt to take a step back and ask, like, where ha you know, what have we gotten wrong? But I didn't start out with the answers, right? I only started out with this question in the back of my mind. And over time, with experience and research, I started to stitch together a new perspective and understanding of, of the problem, which serves as the basis of Lean Out. And one of the most formative experiences in that journey happened at a team offsite at Google about six years ago at their headquarters in Mountain View, California. Now, Google loves team offsites and they love team building exercises, and their favorite one is this personality profile, which I love too, honestly. But, uh, you know, you take a survey before the offsite, and it's a really extensive survey about kind of who you are. And when you, we arrived in the conference room in Mountain View, we were handed these thick black booklets the, with the results, and they were like these stunningly accurate portraits of who we are. And um, on the inside cover of each booklet was one of four colors, which represented one of the four major personality types. And I was a green, which meant I have a strong drive to help people, I strive for harmony, and I prioritize my relationships. With, I joke in the book that like, this is the hippie group, which is not something you necessarily want to be a part of in an offsite of corporate sales managers, but that's what it was. And by the way, they don't just call it, to underscore this point, they don't just call it green, they call it earth green. And the opposite of green was red or fiery red. And reds are competitive, they strive for power and control, and they prioritize results over greens like me who prioritize relationships. So the HR person running this exercise tells us to get in groups by color. So I go over to the green section, I see Carol waving at me over from the reds, and suddenly a question pops into my mind, which I blurred out loud. What are the colors of our senior executives in, in the business organization? I mean, I know that we've all done this a million times. This HR person knows, and this poor HR person knew and clearly did not want to answer the question, <laughs> only fueled everyone's curiosity until she cracked. And it turned out nine out of 10 of our senior executives were green. Just kidding, they were red. Usually people laugh at this point, but I can't hear anyone. So I'm gonna assume you guys are all chuckling because it makes me feel good. Anyway, this might seem like an obvious thing now, right? But at the time it was a huge insight for me, particularly around the concept of motivation. Because in the, in the business world, in the corporate world, once you get past a certain salary, each raise becomes incrementally less rewarding or motivating. If you get a $20,000 raise and you're making 50K a year, that's life changing. But if you're making 300K, it's hardly the thing that's pushing you every day to work as hard as, hard as you can. Which begs the question then, what is it that motivates people to work so hard to climb higher and higher up the ladder if social scientists tell us that with each raise it becomes incrementally less rewarding, motivating? You know, what is it? Well, one of the big ones is power. More power over more people. But if you're a green like me, not only is having this formal authority over other people and satisfying and unrewarding, it can be, it can actually be very uncomfortable. The reason being that relationships and authority are in tension with each other and everybody is more motivated by one or the other. I'll give you an example. Let's say you're working on a team with your two best friends for years and then suddenly you're promoted to be their manager. Let's say you flex that position of authority, you get, you know, real strict, you're like, I'm the boss lady now, you're telling them what to do. What happens to your relationships? They suffer, right? But what happens if you do, you do nothing? You act like nothing has changed. You're their best buddies as you always have been. What happens? Your authority is undermined. And that's what I mean by these things being in tension with each other and everyone's more motivated by one or the other. Now, with this concept in mind, I have to take you back to what's happening in my career at the time. I was up for a promotion. I was still at Google. And... I had the highest scores on our team for almost two years, and so I became eligible for this promotion. But Google has a policy that in order to get promoted beyond the level where I was, I would need to start managing a team. And until then, I had chosen to be an individual contributor, whereas all my peers at that time were managers. And you know, I mentioned I'm a single mom. My kids were babies at the time. 
And I felt like I was responsible for enough people at home. I didn't want to be responsible for more people at work. I just really wanted to do work. But honestly, even if I wasn't a mom, I just, being a manager didn't appeal to me. I'm very creative. I like to dig into the work. At the same time, I was very hesitant about telling my manager. Um, and at this point, I hadn't because I knew that if I talked to her honestly about my uh, ambivalence toward managing people, I knew that it would be seen as Marissa lacks ambition and I wouldn't be taken seriously. This is actually how managers at Google um, rate their employees. So I had this whole conversation with Carol of all people the other day where she was telling me, you know, they have, this is sort of new in the past few years, but um, there's only some version of this where they, all managers look at their employees on an axis, on a uh, matrix, where one axis is uh, competence, you know, are you good at your job? And then another axis is ambition. And if you are high on both, you are given more resources and attention and you qualify for more things and you're taken seriously. And so expressing um, ambivalence about managing people would put me in the, in the low category. But after the colors exercise, suddenly I had this whole new lens on the situation. Like this is something we teach our kids or learn in kindergarten. Everybody likes different things. So I figured if I explained to her that as a green, a management position would be more of a punishment than a reward, that she would understand that this is not an issue with me, it's an issue with you know incentives at Google. So I had this naive idea that we'd have this conversation and she would be like, of course, that makes total sense. We'll exempt you from the policy. That's literally how I thought it would go. Um, and she was super gracious about it, but it did not go that way. She said that she understood where I was coming from, but that our VP of sales and marketing, despite having heard this argument before, remained steadfast in her view that in order to really grow a career at Google and elsewhere, you needed to manage bigger and bigger teams. And at first I was really dumbfounded by this. Like, why wouldn't they want to keep their top performers motivated by giving them things they actually want? But with time and experience, I realized and learned what no business book ever told me and trust I've read them all and that is what I saw as a simple difference in personality others saw as a weakness the reason so many women get stuck under the glass ceiling isn't because they lack ability or ambition they they simply lack anything meaningful to work toward one example is research that shows that compared to women men are more motivated by and perform better in competitive win-lose scenarios, whereas women prefer and are more motivated by win-win collaborative environments. But most companies, it's a zero-sum game by its nature of a triangle, right? Spots become more scarce and you're competing for them. If you win a promotion, that means I lost it. And at companies like Google and Facebook, you're rated relative to your peers. So you can't be equally amazing or equally terrible as your coworker. You have to be rated either better or worse. Another example is research that shows that compared to men, women have more life goals and they're of a greater variety, whereas men have fewer life goals and are more, they're more focused on money and rank in their career. What comes with the promotion? Money and, and rank. And what else comes with the promotion? Usually more management responsibility, which requires more face time, which compromises the balance and flexibility that women need and crave in order to reach a larger variety of life goals. Now, it's not just an issue with motivation, though. There's also the issue of performance evaluations. So it's widely known that women dominate academia and have dominated academia since every year since 1983. And a big question is, why doesn't that dominance last after graduation? Conventional wisdom tells us it's because culture conditions women to be nice and obedient, which may work in school, but not so much in the business world. But actually, the answer is much simpler. It's grades. In school, you're evaluated in a pretty objective way. If you get a 95 on a test, you get an A, regardless of how you behave. If you compare that in the corporate world, most large organizations, there's so many people around doing so many different things, it's really hard to tell who's doing a good job. I mean, honestly, sometimes it's hard to tell who's doing any 
work at all. Think about, always think about the Seinfeld episode where George is hiding under the desk or strategically. I don't know if you guys seen Seinfeld. It's a, a last generation kind of thing. Anyway, I digress. Um, so we also are in a knowledge economy, right? It's very hard to measure objectively someone's performance. You can't count the number of widgets that were produced between the hours of nine to five. So what happens is in this ambiguity and chaos, our brains default to whatever is most visible and use these visible behaviors as proxies for competence and leadership. So it's people that talk about their work the most and the loudest or the best at self-promotion or the most aggressive, the biggest desire for dominance. These are the behaviors that our brains default to and use as proxies. And social sciences tell us that these visible behaviors like aggression and self-aggrandizement correlate more highly with men. But they don't correlate more highly with competence. Now, the point in all of this is that these things like motivation, reward, performance, evaluations, these are all systems problems. They are not female problems. The system is broken. Women are not broken. And people ask, you know, then why do we use this system or where does it come from? I mean, a corporate hierarchy was designed a couple hundred years ago in the industrial age. It was really the first time in this country that business had to organize hundreds and large amounts of workers in some sort of system to achieve business goals. And the titans of that era were men. Naturally, they're going to design these systems from their worldview. If I'm more motivated by competitive win-lose games, I'm going to set it up as a competition. It's been 200 years plus since then. And in that time, everything has changed. The economy is completely transformed. The composition of our workforce is completely changed. These underlying structures in business are the only thing that have remained exactly the same. And the question I pose in the book is what makes more sense, rewiring women's personalities to conform to this outdated system or rewiring the system to better meet the needs of a diverse workforce? So I devote, you know, so I devote a whole chapter to what companies can do to change and lean out. But when I talk to prof lots of professional men and women, what I say is, you know, at the end of the day, I think all we really want is some control over our careers and our happiness and career satisfaction. And we don't have to wait for power structures in the business world to change in order to do that. So you can try and change the rules of the game or you can change how you play it. And how you play it, focus on things you can control, the biggest of which is how we define our own success. And in the book, I suggest orienting around the metric of well-being instead of, instead of winning. And what that means is being honest with ourselves about who we are, what we want, and owning it. And also recognizing that our institutions are not designed to fulfill all of our needs. But the real definition of self-empowerment is taking ownership for our needs and what we want and not relying on an external structure or other people to fulfill that for us. So I'm going to uh, close with the story of, that's an example of how I sort of changed the way that I define my own success and changed the way that I played the game. And it goes back to that promotion that I talked about earlier, about which I was ambivalent. I ended up going for it because I just felt like, you know what, it's what I should do. There was really no other reason. And my manager, so she opened up headcount for me. We were interviewing and I was eligible for the promotion. And when performance cycles came around, she sits me down in the conference room and tries to let me down gently that the promotion actually didn't even go through for some political reason that was out of her control. And she felt horrible. And I was obviously very angry and upset. This had been sold to me as a done deal. And so she was, you know, really upset about it and asked what she could do to keep me happy until I can get promoted the next cycle. And, you know, while she was asking, I, I was just angry until it dawned on me that had I gotten the promotion, I'd have to stay on the project that I was on for another two years at least, which I was itching to, for something new anyway, and I'd have to manage people. So I'd be going to work every day, working on something I was so over and managing people to boot. 
But now that I didn't get the promotion, I could change projects and remain in IEC. So on a daily basis, you know, my, my happiness should have been higher. At the same time, I still felt like I deserved something for all of my hard work. So when she asked me what that was, you know, I really thought long and hard about it. And when I was honest with myself, what I, at the end of the day, what I really wanted was money and compliments. I wanted to be told I was doing a good job and some flexibility in my schedule. By the way, usually when I'm in front of a live audience, like sometimes it's all women, sometimes it's a mix. But whenever I say the thing about compliments, I always see the women, there's so many women in the audience that are nodding like, yes. And the men always just like stare at me blankly. Like, what is she talking about? So it's just a little thing I noticed that's kind of funny, but resonant for a lot of women in that, you know, the need for recognition and compliments, which is nothing that we should be ashamed of, by the way. Um, so that's what I told her. And she said, you know, thanks for being honest with me. It was the first time I was ever really honest with my manager about what I truly wanted. Maybe even the first time I was honest with myself. And she said she'd see what she could do. But really, I mean, neither of us expected much. And then a few weeks later, sitting at my desk, and I got an email popped up from my boss's boss's boss. And in it, he went on sort of um, outlining all the great things I've contributed and, and, and how wonderful they all were. Like, it was very clear that my manager had written it and then he copied and pasted it to me, which was fine. I was just so happy to, like, you know, get it. And at the end of the email, he says, because you did such a good job, the managers on the team and I have agreed to a lot, 60% of our discretionary budget to you in the form of a bonus, you know, this quarter. It was a lot of money and it was totally unexpected. And I, I was floored, mostly because I had asked for what I wanted and I got it. And I, I realized and I totally understand that the stories don't always end so neatly like that, you know, like a fairy tale ending, which it wasn't. The point being, in order to get what I wanted, I first had to even know what that was. Because as crazy as it seems, I had been working so hard for 11 or 12 years at that point for things that I actually didn't want. Instead of trying to figure out who I was and what I wanted and needed and asking for that, I was sort of going along with the script of what I was supposed to want and what the system spit out as rewards. I sort of just blindly accepted as the markers for my own progress in my, in my career. So what does lean out mean? It doesn't mean quit your job or take the foot off the pedal of your career. It simply means leaning out of anyone else's story for who you should be and what your career should look like. And I'm going to close today with a quote that I used to open the book, which um, I love. It just really captures the entire sentiment of lean out. And that it's a quote by a woman, G.D. Anderson. And it says, feminism isn't about making women strong. Women are already strong. It's about changing the way the world perceives that strength. Thank you guys for having me tonight. Um, I really hope there's some questions. Q&A is my favorite part. I'm an open book. You can ask me anything. So please don't be shy. If you have questions, I don't know, Mary or Paige, how you want to do it um, in the chat or if people want to speak, but I'll follow your lead on this one. Yeah, I would like to open it up to the audience and um, just have them ask questions. Who wants to go first? Lily, perfect. Take it uh, away. Wait, you're on mute, Lily. Am I good now? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Marissa, my name is Lily. Before I ask my question, I just wanna say thank you so much for being here tonight. I found your story really inspiring and just thank you for sharing it with us all. Thanks so much. I, I Like you listened about the part for compliments, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my question is, Lean Out has been out for a little shy of a year. What kind of response have you received and what has been the biggest surprise since it launched? The biggest prize? Is that what you said? Surprise. Like what, what was the biggest surprise since it launched? Oh, surprise. Mm -hmm. So the feedback, so I get messages from readers, um, all, mostly in the U.S., but I've, I've had some from um, people, women all over the world. Basically, they have a pat there's a theme in the feedback that I get, which is women thanking me for making them feel heard and understood and giving them a language to articulate the way they have thought and felt but haven't seen 
um, echoed in any of the public discourse, which is honestly why I wrote this book, because I felt like the public discourse on women at work was dominated by a handful of very elite and powerful women, and the narrative was very homogenous. It was all reflective of their experiences. And the conversations I had with professional working women over my career weren't anything like that. Um, and so a lot of us felt like there was just some, you know, disconnect. There wasn't anything real being said that reflected who we were and who our, what our experiences were. And so I kind of wrote the book that I needed to read when I was starting out in my career because for so long, um, I felt like there was something wrong with me, honestly. Um, it, it, my disconnect of who I was and the, that, what was reflected to me in that world, it was two different things. And I think what I'm learning from the response from readers is that there's so many women that feel that way. And so, it, you know, they really appreciate sort of um, the message. Uh, the biggest surprise? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, the biggest surprise, I think overall, the biggest surprise to me is how hard this journey is from corporate safety, paycheck benefits to really being an entrepreneur in that I am my own business now. And I knew the risks going into it. I knew it wasn't going to be easy, but it is harder than I, I really thought, which is a good thing because had I known, maybe I would have hesitated more. So it's been so rewarding and so difficult and I wouldn't want it any other way, frankly. Thank you again and thank you for answering my question. Thanks so much, thanks for the great question. And thanks for the compliment, Lillian. Yeah. <laughs> and just to um, take off that, I, I can imagine when Marissa asks her audience about compliments and the women are all saying yes and the men say nothing, what does it cost to give somebody a compliment? Nothing. Just think about that. Yeah. Right, who, has, who has the next question? I can go. Thank you, Emma. Hi, Marissa. My name is Emma. And also, like Lillian said, thank you so much for being here and speaking with us. I really resonated a lot with what you said. Um, and so my question to you is kind of looking for advice as a young business student about to enter the corporate world. One of my concerns, I think, being a young woman is everyone talks about this work-life balance and like, I wanna have a family, I wanna have kids. And something that's a little bit concerning to me is will I be able to be a good mom one day? Mm -hmm. and able to reach all my career goals. So if you could comment on that, I would really appreciate it. The, I love this question because I was in exactly the same place when I was your age coming out of school. I have always had this really strong nurturing component to who I am and I've always really wanted kids and thought, you know, I, I worried about that a lot before I was even married, frankly. And here, a couple of surprising things happen. When I gave birth to my first child, my son, Zachary, the first four weeks I cried, like, I can never go back to work. How could I ever leave my baby? This is horrible. How can women do that? And then I was so fortunate to have such a generous maternity leave with Google. And an interesting thing happened because by the third month, the fourth month, I went back at five. I was so bored at home, I couldn't wait to go back to work, which was something I totally did not expect. Um, I realized, you know, just not sort of putting my brain to work was not the right thing for me. And I'm the biggest supporter of women doing what's best for them. Like if you stay at home, if you work, I, I could care less, like to each his own. I did not expect me to feel that way about wanting to go back to work. So the first thing I'll say is you might be surprised by how you feel when you actually go through these experiences and it might not be what you expect and you might not want what you expect. So one is don't worry too much because you don't know how you're going to feel. Um, another thing I'll say is every single thing you do in life has a trade-off. And you have to decide for yourself what your priority is. So if you decide that, you know, you really do want the balance and flexibility to be able to manage, you know, reach your career goals and be, you know, home a lot, then you might have to accept reaching your career goals might take you longer. Um, people that sacrifice their family life for their career reach their heights of their career, maybe regret later on not spending more time with their family, or maybe that's an active choice they made. 
But I think you have to be real realistic that um, there are trade-offs to every single thing that you choose. And if, you know, your priorities might change, you know, so it used to be more important for me to have the flexibility because I needed to be around, you know, when my kids were much younger and now I can, you know, put the pedal down a little bit more on my career. So these things change. I know this advice is kind of cliche is to not worry so much because you don't know how you're going to feel in the moment. Um, but it is, it is true. Um, you don't know how you're going to feel. So at every stage, I would say, take a step back and be honest with yourself about what's most important to you. And if that means you're not going to be promoted as quicker, or if that means you're not going to be home as much, as long as you're honest with yourself about what you want and you accept the trade-offs, that's the most we can expect for ourselves. I agree 100%. That was perfectly put. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Next question. Um, I have a question. So my name is Emily and I just want to say thank you um, so much for speaking with us tonight. Um, I definitely learned a lot about what I should keep in mind going forward. Um, so my question is, what has the transition from Google and Facebook to a solo career been like? And what has been the biggest challenge that you've faced since leaving your corporate environment? Getting a social following, which reminds me, no. That's a half joke, but half serious. So I'm going to take this opportunity to give you my social handles, which um, back in the day, my agent used to get so upset when he would see me speak because I would totally forget this part. So in his honor, um, it's Marissa Beth. My middle name is Beth, B-E-T-H. Marissa Beth Orr on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me on LinkedIn. Okay, with that promotional message out of the way. Um, the transition has been wonderful and very tough. And, you know, I... I really, I, I read all these things like from, you know, Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk and all these um, thought leaders about entrepreneurship. And um, I just feel like they are really lacking in the honesty of how, how tough it is. Um, especially I'm a single mom. So I have a household that I run by myself with three kids. Um, so perhaps for me, it is more, more challenging and difficult to manage. I really miss the security and the safety of that world. Um, I miss my friends and the social structure. At the same time, I wouldn't trade it for the world because it's so rewarding to do, to really um, be able to depend on yourself for things and not be at the mercy of a manager. Again, this depends on who you are as a person. I was never, I realized after the fact, a person that was going to fall in line in the corporate world. I'm too, I don't know, uh, rebel, I guess rebellious a little bit, um, a little bit anti-authority in a hippie sort of way. So it was just never the right fit for me. With that said, if I could go back and do it all over again, and I tell women this all the time, because as a lot of women get further into their careers in the corporate world, they start to, at least from what they tell, what I hear and what women reach out to me about, is that they start to develop these interests and passions and other things and they're not sure how to balance it. So if I could go back and do it all over again, I would probably continue writing the book on the side if I could go back to Google and have sort of a little bit of the best of both, right? Because it's very difficult not to have, and I'm being totally straight up and honest with you, um, because you guys deserve the truth of my experience. Uh, a lot of people come on and, and say how amazing it is and you should, you know, follow your heart. And I'm saying you should follow your heart, but understand it's not easy. Um, so I would probably go back and, and um, maybe collect the paycheck and the benefits and put more into building the side business over time. With that said, I think if I had, if I did do that, I might not have the fire under me and the urgency to have done what I've done in the time that I've done it. If I was still at Google, I don't think I would have written a book in two years and published it and started a speaking career. So um, I think it's been a, a really hard transition, but I have learned a lot. I have grown tremendously. I feel like I'm still at the base of a very large summit that I've yet to climb. And I've been through so much and risked so much and had so many challenges, which ends up giving you such a rock hard foundation of self-respect and confidence that nobody can ever take away from you. And that has been the real reward, which I wouldn't trade for anything. That's great. What, what was one of the biggest challenges? 
Anxiety. So I, I once heard this quote. Um, oh, by the way, I also have a. So you can see I was in marketing my whole career, and now I'm like the worst self promoter. Um, so I also have a podcast that I started recently called "Nice Girls Don't Watch The Bachelor," which is irreverent and a joke because I love The Bachelor. Uh, but uh, so I'll say that as well. The hardest part has been. Um, so I heard this quote that when you leave the corporate world to start your own thing, you trade depression for anxiety. And I think that that captures it really, really well because when you're at the mercy of, you know, a corporate structure, it can be, you know, you feel can feel stifled and suffocated and depressed. And then when you do your own thing, you have freedom and then you're constantly anxious about um, money and am I doing the right things? Am I planning my day? All the decisions fall on you. And sometimes, you know, I wish I could just go back for just a day to have that manager give me the project I'm responsible for instead of having to, you know, figure it out all myself. So I think the hardest thing has been just battling the anxiety of having taken this risk and um, having to be 100% responsible for how, you know, I go forward. Again, I wouldn't trade it for the world, but it, that's been the hardest part. Money, the anxiety over money, to be succinct. Thank you for being honest. Anybody so else? everybody go out and buy the book. No, I'm kidding. Yes. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Anybody have any other questions? I actually have a question. Hello. Hello. My name Hello. is Sal here. I, Hello, Marissa. Marissa. So um, I heard you uh, talk about that you actually started a podcast. And me and my close friend, Oliver Tavares, that's in this meeting right now, we started a podcast Hi, as well. Yes. Yeah. So. So yes, I heard you talk about it. I, how have you, have you enjoyed it? I mean, what's been difficulties with that? Being that like, you know, you had your career right now set in the corporate world and now you're doing something on the side. So I just started the podcast in March. I only have about five episodes. The hard part is just having to plan the content and, you know, if I'm interviewing somebody, get that logistics and all that stuff down. Um, you know, sometimes I have issues with like video editing or production, minor things. The podcast really hasn't been that big of a challenge for me because so a friend of mine from Google called me the other day that he wanted to start a podcast and, um, he wanted me to be the co-host because we always had a great rapport back in the day. And one of the first things he asked me was how do I get analytics about the podcast? How do I know like who's listening, how many people are listening, where they're coming from? And I said to him, look, if that's what you're worried about on, before you've even started, this is maybe not the thing for you. And I say that to illustrate my attitude toward the podcast, which is it's another platform for me to get my message out there. And I'm seeing it more as like fun, writing to me is very um, personal and stressful. The podcast is almost like a, a more, a less stressful. Um, a therapeutic. It, yeah, in a way, it's just another way to get my message out there. And it's not as stressful for me as writing for some reason. So it's something that I do to keep myself accountable for um, being more active. It's hard to explain, but it, writing takes writing one article on Medium. Oh, that's another thing. I'm on Medium at Marissa Orr. Um, I have all my articles there, including the prologue of the book. Um, you know, that's an article takes me a month, a short article, um, a podcast. I can just sort of talk. It's almost like, um, a way to get my message out there. That's not as personally stressful. My ego is not, frankly, my ego is not as invested in it because it's not a piece of writing. Um, so it's just kind of fun for me right now. Um, and there's no, yeah, there, I don't know if I've answered your question well, but there's oh, no big thought no, behind it besides yes, getting my yeah. message out there on a different platform. For sure. Yeah. I what is your that. podcast it's, about? So uh, actually, oh. similarly, I mean, oh. again. <laughs> don't get me started. Don't get me so, started. I don't want to know. Now I don't want to know. No, no, yeah. no, I do want to just say, I do want to just say, we're like, we embody like the same message that you're talking about. You know, we don't focus on, you know, the numbers, the subscribers, et cetera. You know, we're all about, you know, you know, teaching our viewers, sending them a message and not just to entertain, but it's, you know, informative for them, especially. Yeah. And yeah. again, I think we would love to have you on the show as well. It's just done. <laughs> I feel to add to what Seriously, Sal's saying, reach out to me. I'll do it for 100%. Sure. Thank you That's so much. Awesome. To add what Sal was saying, especially with that podcast we created to just create a voice. 
create a voice for people who don't know about college, who don't know what to do for the next step of their life. And I feel like so many people are so confused, like myself. I didn't even know what college was. So the mm-hmm. fact that you could hear someone, hey, go through something and be like, wow, I'm not the only one. I think that's huge. We have track players. We've had MLB agent. We had a wide receiver from Syracuse. All these different stories that come together. And you could, a lot of people reached out saying, hey, like that gives me an idea. So. That's the reason. Good for you guys. That's awesome. Because I'll say, if focusing on the outcome is very difficult, and I'm learning this as I go along. I used to have this, I used to read all the books, like I'd have a vision board and have this totally big vision for what I was going to do. And it has helped, but at the same time, what I've learned is focusing on the process of creating versus what it can do for me and the outcome and the accolades will lead in the long term to a more productive, fulfilling career. And it's not easy, but I, I, as a principle, it's something to follow. So good for you guys. For sure. Thank you again. I appreciate that. Thank You're you for welcome. the whole presentation My as well. pleasure. That's awesome. We want to be respectful of Marissa's time, but I'm sure she'll take one or two more questions. Yep. Do you have plans for a second book? Yes. I'm working on the proposal right now. Um, it's interesting because with uh, the COVID and everything that's happened, my speaking career, I had a whole pipeline of, um, so I wrote the book because I knew I had a book in me, but I knew I had to write the book in order to start a speaking career. You don't, you just don't command the kind of fees if, you know, you don't have a book out there. So um, I was speaking, I was supposed to be in London this week, actually. So all these things got canceled and the good part of that is I was able to channel more energy into the second book um and I'm working on it now and people are, well, what is it about I'm not really sure because sometimes I don't know until I get further into it what it is I'm really trying to say but it extends on the themes of lean out um and sort of overturns conventional wisdom in different areas of management and leadership not just around women um so yeah, something to do with that. And I'm writing the proposal now and hopefully I'll be done with it in a year or two. Good luck. Yeah, that's awesome. That's true. Thank you. Okay, how about one more? Any, um, a lot of women in business members here and we have some faculty and staff here. How about one also more question? questions about what it's like to work at Google and Facebook. Uh, you can ask anything related to that. I have a question. Uh, um, have you ever met Mark Zuckerberg? <laughs> I saw him in his glass conference room in Menlo Park, but no. Oh. Yeah. I have a question about your story that you told. Um, I'm Aurora, by the way. Thank you for being here. Um, So I was very shocked when you got got that response from Cheryl, and her name was Karen, right? Or is that wrong? Oh, Karen. That's probably what came to mind, but I actually (laughs) named her Kimberly, but I should (laughs) have. That was before Karen was a thing. Otherwise, I might have. (laughs) Um, Do you feel like that was a, like, female on female, like, power dynamic? Because I feel like sometimes that could, Mm -hmm. that, like, happens in the workplace, like, where women are, like, against each other. Yeah. So, so, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Do you feel like if it, I feel like sometimes if men take initiative like that to, you know, reach out to the COO and get their name out there, that it's not received as poorly. Like, do you agree with that? So first I'll say, I've been shy. So to answer the other question earlier, actually, what has surprised me most is after every speaking engagement, when women come up to after to talk to me, 70% of the time it's to share a story that happened to them that was similar to what I went through. And what I started to see is there's like this epidemic of girl on girl crime, I call it, um, in the corporate world of emotional abuse. And you can find, I, I wrote a whole article about this question on my Medium page. Again, it's at Marissa Orr. Um, I can have, you know, I can send out the link because uh, it's not quite clear looking at which one it is. But anyway, um, the point of the article and the answer to the question that I'll give you is abuse is so we focus so much with me too on sexual harassment and all that kind of stuff, but abuse is not about gender. It's about power. And whenever you have an environment where people with powerful people that have control over you in your career, there will be abuse that happens. The reason that the, that this variety doesn't get as much attention is because 
um, women aggress toward other women differently. And it's very under the radar and covert, which can be very insidious because it's very difficult to explain to people around you what's happening. It's death by a thousand cuts. It's not something very egregious, black and white, which really is the case, any emotional abuse. Um, <clears throat> so I think that the issue with Kimberly was one less about, you know, gender, more about power. It's a certain profile of person that ends up in, sometimes ends up in these very powerful positions. She, in, in my particular case, she's a sociopath. And I say that, you know, honestly, I, I, I used to be afraid. People would ask me if, if I was afraid to write the story and, or the book, I was afraid of Cheryl or whatever. I was never afraid of anything except Kimberly hiring a hitman to kill me. <laughs> And it, the reason was because I had just read Martha Beck's amazing book, which I highly recommend, called The Sociopath Next Door, which is an amazing book, but not, not I wouldn't recommend it if you've just outed a sociopath publicly, uh, <laughs> because you really sort of learn the dynamics of, you know, how that abuse, what it looks like. So I think in, in, in this case, it was very severe and very extreme. And I think gender played less of a role than the power dynamic and the sociopathy um, that was involved. I think had I had a different manager, my meeting with Cheryl might have been interpreted completely differently. But she was a very unique kind of predator, I'll say, because the reason I had found out is I connected with coworkers from Google who um, had worked for her in the past and had similar experiences, which I talk about in the book. Um, so I think in this case, I wouldn't say it was because I was a woman. I would say because she's a sociopath. But I do think that there are certain dynamics or certain things women do that are judged differently than when a man does it. I just wouldn't say this was one of those cases. Whatever happened to Kimberly? Oh, she's still there, more powerful than ever. Because It's funny, I, I watch all these... Um, documentaries now about, you know, people in these power structures that have done wrong, oh God, and the connection to what's happening now. But anyway, we went through an HR investigation, like, you can't be fired because somebody wrote a story about what happened, you know, it actually only makes her more powerful, because now the people that work with her are more afraid of her. And, you know, she can't, yeah, she can't be fired now for what somebody wrote after you know they they left Facebook so I'm sure she is telling her own version of the story internally and people are only going to be more deferential and it will only create more fear around her so sometimes it, it um, creates it makes that person more powerful but honestly I wrote the story for myself I, I I didn't care actually how that affected her whether it hurt or helped I mean I I wasn't trying to hurt her. I was trying to tell my own truth. And did you ever hear from her after you left and after you wrote the book? No, but I've heard from people at Facebook. Um, she fight so the reason she called me and she called me for that recruiting call was because one of her directors had I had worked with very closely at Google. It was now at Facebook, and this role opened, and he was like, "Oh, call Mar Maris is the best for this." And so I joined, she ended up firing him. She ended up firing like three other people. Facebook fires, fired more, at Google, like you, it was very hard to get fired. I never saw, I, I never saw, I saw maybe in 13 years, three or four people get fired. In 18 months of Facebook, I must have seen 10 or 15. Um, it was a total, I expected it to be Google a smaller, I, I just expected it to be like Google and it was just nothing like Google. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for answering my question. Sure. One more and then, and then we'll go. Anyone else? Yeah, Last night. All right. Well, thank you guys. This Marissa, has been really fun. Thank you so much. You were absolutely amazing. Is it okay if we share Thank your you. contact information with uh, Sal and Oliver for the podcast? Oh, absolutely. For sure, please. <laughs> the students want to absolutely in by your book. That yes, I'm very responsive on social because I have like such a small following. I can be. Um, <laughs> so don't hesitate for anybody on the call to reach out. Um, 
again, my all my articles, the prologue of the book is at Marissa Orr on Medium. So check it out. And uh, thanks so much, you guys. Do you want to put your information in the chat? Is that, can you do that? Can you put your social I'm sorry, in the chat? You were brief. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be awesome. Um, chat. Yes. Okay. No problem. I'll do that now. Um, Miss Beth Orr is Insta and Twitter. And then Medium is at Marissa Orr. And then I'm just going to quickly put in the link that tells the whole story of what I just shared. So this is the prologue of the book. And it includes this story. Can you guys see it? Did it come through? Yes. Yes. I okay. So that's, so that medium link is the, um, you know, the whole story. And then I'll put the one about girl on girl crime too. So you have it there um, for the person who asked, but now my computer won't, uh, I'll send it after because my, oh wait, yeah, my computer's being super Chris, slow. If you want but, to send it to me after, I'll be happy to send it out because we don't have our full population at this point anyway. Okay, great. Okay. And Marissa is in talks with uh, Lee Quinn, our department chair for marketing and MIS, and she may be teaching one day at FDU, so this will not be uh, the last time that you I would love that, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Marissa. Right. Thank you again. You were Thank amazing. Thank you so much. And let's keep oh, in touch. Awesome. Bye. Thanks, Thank guys. Bye. 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 Have a good day, everyone. Mm -hmm. Patent page, stay on. <laughs>